Hi there, welcome back. And we're going to deal with a very important and very, very interesting topic today. Maybe, maybe a pivotal topic in the whole course. It's called Odin's theory of distillation. And, and I love it. More importantly, the students love it. And I'm pretty sure you're going to love it as well. We're going to talk about distillation and we're going to talk about flavors and how you can capture certain flavors during distillation. So what I'm going to do today is first talk a little bit about distilling. Then we're going to talk about distillation, about stripping, about cuts. We're going to talk about where you can find certain fractions and how you can find certain flavors and how, given a certain spirit category that you want to make, let's say a rum or a brandy, what flavors you should expect where. And if you don't get them over, where they shoot, we're going to teach you and train you on how to actually get it right and make your gin taste the way a gin should taste. Help you make a whiskey that tastes the way a whiskey should make. So let's start with a little bit of distilling. We have two topics after this on still design that will dive very deep into how stills are designed and how you can take benefits from certain designs and what are the positives and negatives of certain designs. But I just want to start out with a really simple sketch on distilling. Distilling is basically the separation of two liquids by boiling points. Doesn't sound very sexy, especially if you understand that, that you now as the distiller are the manager of the separation process of two liquids via their different boiling points. Let's just call you a distiller and let's call this machine a still or a prototype still. Let's say this is a pot and we put wine in there. We make things easy on ourselves. We're not going to mash, we're not going to ferment. We're just going to go to the shop, buy a few bottles of wine, pour them in a pot and we're going to create gases because if we create gases, we can actually take advantage of different boiling points, create a stronger wine, fortify the wine, make a brandy. But in order to create gases, the first thing that we need is a heat source. We need to basically bring the, the wine to a boil so that all the energy that we put in is translated into gas formation, basically like, like boiling potatoes or, or spaghetti or macaroni. Bring the water to a boil, create a lot of gases. Now if we put wine in there, now if we put water in there, the only molecule if we put water in there is H2O. And the only gas we're going to create is water vapor, water gas. And as you, as you are well aware from boiling potatoes or, or spaghetti in a pot, those vapors basically go anywhere. So what you do in the kitchen is basically put a lid on it so that the amount of evaporation and the number, the amount of steam in your kitchen is, is manageable, under control. Or maybe you have one of those uh, uh, vents on top of your stuff that actually pulls the vapors out and makes sure that your kitchen isn't, uh, isn't looking like you're driving into a dense fog. Let's say we put wine in there. Let's say that wine is 11% strong in alcohol. That still means there is 89% of water. And there's 11% of alcohol. Now, what I want you to understand is that the alcohol boiling point is around 78 degrees Celsius. And the water boiling point is around 100 degrees Celsius. That basically means that the molecules, the alcohol molecules in the wine that we are heating up, that we're boiling, boil earlier than the water molecules. But since it's a mixture, everything will boil at the same time. Water would boil at 100 degrees, pure alcohol at 78. But since the wine is a mixture of both, the boiling temperature is going to be somewhat under 100 degrees, let's say 95. And in the process of evaporation, because I want you to envision those alcohol molecules with their very low boiling point as lighter molecules, 
Chemically, that is not a correct definition, but please look at them like that. The water molecules are the heavy, the fat dudes, it's very difficult to jump in the air. The alcohol ones are the tiny bits, the small ones, the lean characters. If they jump up, they jump up far. What is this translates to is the following. And even if we have only 11% of those alcohols in the wine that we are bringing to a boil, in the vapors, since they boil at a lower point, since it takes less energy to heat them up, to bring them to gas phase, in the gases, we have an overrepresentation of those alcohols. If we have 11% in the boiler, the gases may well be 40%. So the first step of distillation is quite easy. Put some wine in a pot, put on the fire, wait until it boils, and the gases that come off are now three to four times stronger than the alcohol percentage in the boiler, in the pot. The problem is that in this setup, you're not really going to make anything out of it, right? All the vapors just evaporate and that's all. So in order to make a still, a distillation machine out of this, we need more than the pot and the heat source. We also need a riser or a bridge, basically something that guides the gases in a certain direction, preferably away from the heat source because alcohol is flammable we don't want those alcohol-rich vapors near the fire because potentially that would create a fire or explosion hazard. So we still usually bends the gases away from the pot, make sure they don't evaporate, no leaks. And what we do here is basically put a cooler around it because those vapors, even those stronger in alcohol, are undrinkable because you just burn your mouth if you try to inhale those gases. So we need to cool them back to liquid phase. Cooling water in, cooling water out, and the through tube you see the gases go back to liquid and all of a sudden we have a liquid of around 40 percent. Now you well know that a brandy in general is 40 percent, so you could say okay I'll put a few bottles of wine in a pot, create a riser and a bridge and do a cooler and all of a sudden I end up with a 40 percent brandy. Yeah, but not really, right? Because as the distillation process continues, what happens is that since more of the alcohols are represented in the vapors, the alcohol percentage in the boiler is going to drop to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 percent. The alcohol percentage is going to drop rapidly because more alcohol evaporates into your brandy. So during the run, as this number falls to 7, 6, 5, 4 percent, the gases become less high in alcohol percentage too, so they go back to 30, 25, 20, 15 percent. So the whole concoction of what you are creating isn't going to be 40 percent, it's only going to be 40 percent at the beginning of the run. At the end of your distillation process, you're probably going to end up with something that is closer to 30 percent. And that's not enough for a brandy. Brandy needs to be, depending on where you are, 37.5, I think, in Europe to 40% or more in the United States in North America. Single distillation can bring you to around 30% if you start with 10-11. 10% wine, 30% result is a sort of one in three. So basically, if we distill a third of the total volume, out of the boiler we create a third of the total volume here and that's a good indication. So let's say we start with six liters, a third of six liters is two liters, so probably by the time we collect two liters it's going to be around 30 percent and most of the alcohol is going to be distilled out from the original pot and out of the wine that you started with. One third. Stripping run, one third. first run that we did, and, and you saw that on the first video that I did, the first content video, the one before this one, stripping run, the goal is to concentrate the alcohol. Get rid of most of, or at least a lot of the water that was in the wine. So we have, let's say, two liters of 30 percent. And we want to create a brandy. What we can do is we can distill that 30% again, do a 
second or double distillation, which is the traditional method methodology for making basically any taste-rich product. Uh, maybe apart from vodka, which needs many more distillation cycles, more on that later, or Irish whiskey, which is traditionally distilled three times instead of two times. But, but bourbon, Scottish whiskey, brandy, cognac, are all distilled twice because 30% doesn't cut it. You want a barrel age at 60, 65. What happens if we redistill 30%? We can bring it to 70, 75. We add a bit of water back to 65%. Goes in the barrel, stays there for a few years. We dilute it again to 40%. There's your brandy, there's your whiskey, there's your rum. <coughs> so we need a second distillation. And the second distillation, we do something else. We're not looking to concentrate the alcohol so much. The goal basically is to separate out the alcohol. So distilling is about, well, distilling is about that pot, a riser, a bridge, and a cooler. It's basically heat exchanger, right? We create vapors, we cool the vapors back down to liquids. And because the alcohol molecules are, are lighter, they are overrepresented. If we distill too long, we continue distilling, we basically end up with an 11% concoction. So you want to stop after collecting around one third. This is what is called the stripping run. Um, so let's do the second run, which is the finishing run. Remember how we looked at water molecules and, and alcohol molecules and alcohol molecules boiling at a lower point, signifying it's easier to bring them to a gas state, resulting in the fact that the gases during distillation are always higher in alcohol percentage than the boiler they come from. Now we're going to fill that boiler again. The wine is now, let's say, 30%. And we create gases that are 60, 70, 75%, depending on where we are in the process. We use the same little system to actually make sure that we create an overall brandy, a new make spirit of around 60, 65%, which is the goal for barrel aging. It extracts the right flavors, which you can read on Understanding barrels. Another topic that we talk about a bit later. First run is about concentrating the alcohol. The second run is about cutting, separating the alcohol. I want you to understand that alcohol is a concoction of a family of alcohols. Starting with acetone, a ketone basically, but, but still considered part of the alcohol family by distillers. Acetone has a boiling point of, of around room temperature, which is why you immediately recognize the smell. Acetone is used as nail polish remover. If you want to take the missus out for dinner and things are running late, she yells down like, I'm almost done, uh, honey, I'm almost ready to leave. And you smell that, that smell of nail polish remover, you know you're in trouble and it will take another half an hour at least. Acetone is nail polish remover. Acetone is a byproduct of fermentation. You find it in wine, you find it in beer. If you're going to make a whiskey, vodka, you are going to have to deal with that very light molecule. Very light, very small, evaporates at room temperature, which is why you smell it all through the house, even though your wife isn't boiling the nail polish remover. She's just putting it on her hands, that's all. There are alcohols that are very small, very light, have low boiling points, come into a gas phase very easily, very quickly, with limited amount of energy. And there's very heavy ones like furfural or propanol or butanol that are very, very heavy, have high boiling points, even higher than water sometimes. And they don't get into a gas phase easily, it takes a lot of energy. And just as with distilling water, and alcohol, like on the first run, we see that a lighter alcohol is overrepresented in the beginning of the run. If we do the finishing run, we have to understand that at the beginning of the run, we see a bleed off of very light alcohols. Acetones, methanol, ethyl acetate, officially not an alcohol, but let's compromise it or let's put it into the family here because that's the way it's often looked at. Boiling points that are lower than the 78 degrees of good ethanol. 
And because these are lighter molecules that make it to the gas phase sooner without a lot of energy, they're overrepresented in the beginning of the run. Why do they tail off? Well, if they're gone, they're gone. We're now left with water and ethanol. Ethanol's the good alcohol, water, ethanol, and the high boiling point, the heavy alcohols, the furfural, the propanol, and butanol. So after the first low boiling point alcohols are boiled off, we get the ethanol, the normal alcohol, the stuff we are after, over. And if the alcohol, the good alcohol, the ethanol that, that, well, that intoxicates us but doesn't give us a headache, slowly trails off because it gets less and less, this percentage drops as we continue the distillation run, slowly more and more of the high boiling point, the really heavy dudes, come over. Heads, hearts, and tails. So we're in the first run, the first distillation run, the goal is to concentrate the alcohol, go fast, get all the alcohol out of there, don't worry about cuts. The second run, the finishing run, is about separating out certain alcohols. And there's been a lot of talk about this. So some people say, look at this, this must be the ideal cut point between heads, hearts and tails, right? This being the hearts, the good stuff, and this being the tails, the end of the run, and this being the heads, the beginning of the run. The light alcohols come over first, the medium ones, the good ones, the ethanol in the middle, and the heavy dudes, the stuff that makes you sick in your stomach, come over at the end of the run. And then people say, okay, did you say sick? In that case, I don't think this is the perfect cut. I think we need to cut out everything, right? We, we don't want tails. We don't want any tails, any, any high boiling alcohols in our new make spirit because I just heard you say sick. We don't want people to get sick. We want people to get uh, drunk, but in a pleasant way. So we'll cut earlier. And, and actually, let's get rid of those heads too, because acetone, you know what? I, I've smelled that, and I don't think I want any of it in my whiskey, in my vodka, in my rum, in my brandy, so let's cut that out as well. And then there's another discussion, a discussion mostly um, evoked or started or, or told by big alcohol. And that's the other way around, like, yeah, yeah, you know what? People do get hangovers when, when they drink too much. It's not because of our drink, it's basically because you drank too much. So let's just incorporate all the heads and all the tails in there because we are now maximizing yield. And if you end up with a stomach problem or with a headache the next morning, we all know it's not my drink because you'll blame yourself. You shouldn't have drinked, drank that much. So there's basically two ways to look at this. Efficiency-wise, incorporate everything. and health-wise incorporate nothing. And those, this was a situation when I arrived on the scene some 10 years ago, and I want to give you a different model because I think there's more to it. And I don't think there's more to it. I've learned that there's much more to it. So what I want to present to you in the next little bit of this video is the holy trinity of distillation where we'll talk about cuts, how they really are, and why they can be extremely important for the product you want to make.